Ladies and gentlemen, I am the American Spy Fox. Welcome to the channel. Before we continue with the Max Wallace video conference call, let me start this off with a response to a lot of your comments. Yes, I have read your comments. I do hear you and a lot of them I agree with. Such a long conversation has taught me so much about communication between people. See, you have to understand that during the editing process, I am going through line by line with a fine tooth comb, and I'm picking out all of these ideas and thoughts and communication that I did not pick up while we were talking. Humans across the board are not meant to accept tons of information second by second and process it all and come to a rational conclusion. Matter of fact, the part of your brain that controls emotions is more likely to react quickly than the part of your brain that is rational. It can take up to 15 minutes for the rational part of your brain to come to a conclusion. That's why people say, sleep on it, think about it, talk to me later. And I have to admit, I reacted rather emotionally at first, but once I slept on it, I came to a more rational conclusion. During the editing process, you go through it line by line, and then you get to really see what the person is trying to relay to you and how you are being perceived by them. Remember, I'm new to this. I haven't done this very long. I'm still learning. However, I do hear your comments about Max Wallace talking out both sides of his mouth. Even I, at the end of the conversation, asked him, dude, what side of the fence are you on? I'm having a hard time even understanding how you truly feel. But the conclusion I have come to after sleeping on it is for Max, it's not about feelings. It doesn't matter how he feels, that's irrelevant. It's what you can prove and what you can't. Now, I have to say that Max must not be very familiar with my channel. I think there was a lot of backhanded comments directed toward me, even though he was saying these people online, these amateur sleuths, and it appeared that he was talking about everybody but me, but I'm pretty sure these were directed at me who say things about Courtney and they have no proof and it's just these bogus theories. Well, that's not what my channel's about, and I don't do that. When I talk about Courtney, it comes from court documents. For example, Max had said that the Isaiah Silva case was a red herring. Well, that's not true. If you read the court transcriptions, there's more evidence in the Isaiah Silva case than there is in the Kurt Cobain case, and Courtney did pay him. She settled. She did not want to go through court and talk about the terrible things that she had done to that boy. She paid him off. So that told me that Max is not very familiar with my channel, and he's not very familiar familiar with Courtney Love and her criminal history. I think that Max might be on the polar opposite. He is so skeptical, so critical, that whenever he hears anything about Courtney Love, he just automatically assumes that it's made up rumor by people who hate her. When in fact, there are tons of things you can talk about dealing with Courtney Love that comes straight from Los Angeles County court documents. It makes sense that Max would not keep up with Courtney Love because he says he has distanced himself from the Cobain case. Uh, he even made the comment that he feels it ruins his credibility within his uh, new circle of colleagues. He is now wanting to be a serious historian. Yeah, I mean, now I'm an historian that does serious historical uh, uh, research, right? But at that time, I was, uh, I was, I would still consider myself a music journalist, right? So in the 90s, now right. I, I sort of try to stay away from all that stuff, right? Because it ruins my credibility. So he wants to distance himself from the Cobain case, the only book that was a New York Times bestseller for him, the book that made his life quite cozy and made him world famous, he now wants to distance himself from. Personally, I would be quite proud if I was in his position, save for the part about creating the whole Alan Wrench story, which was the biggest red herring of all. We'll talk about that later. So he hasn't been paying attention. He hasn't investigated. Courtney Love, probably since the late 90s. Those of you who have come to know me, you trust what I say because you see that I always source my information and you've read up on it yourself and you know that I don't just make things up. Now, whenever I try to talk about something horrible Courtney Love has done and Max blows me off or interrupts or changes the subject or says, oh, those are bogus theories from those internet sleuths. What is he really saying to me? Why would he come on someone's YouTube channel 
after saying that he wanted to distance himself from the case and be taken as a serious writer, a historian, which reminds me, if you would, go ahead and subscribe to my new YouTube channel. It's called History Science Theater, where I will be writing short documentaries about events in history and scientific inventions in ancient history. Why would he go on the biggest channel on YouTube that talks about the Cobain case and then not allow the content creator, me, to speak my mind on my channel? Why would he do that? Now, a lot of you said, my God, has, has Max been paid off by Courtney? What's going on here? Well, no, that, that's not the case. What he's really saying is, I don't trust you. From him to me, I don't trust your word. I don't take you seriously as a journalist. I don't give you any credibility. I think you're one of these internet sleuths who just make things up. Otherwise, if he did trust me and thought I had some credibility, he would listen. And he would say, okay, this guy knows what he's talking about. He's not blowing smoke up my ass. He's credible, so I'll listen. But never once in our entire conversation did Max Wallace listen to me. In fact, every time I tried to inform him, he would either interrupt me, blow it off, or try to one-up me in an attempt to make me look foolish. And in doing so, now not all of you have noticed this, about 70 to 80% of you have noticed the others, maybe they're just not really paying attention, maybe they haven't read between the lines, maybe they're not listening to the entire conversations. Now, I, I don't, uh, it doesn't bother me, it's not like some chip on my shoulder, I'm not, you know, seething with anger. Uh, if you look at my face during the whole interview, I, I I kind of think it's funny because I realized at the very beginning that he did not take me seriously and he was not going to allow me to lead the conversation or anything. One last thing I would like to address. There have been a couple of you, even a couple of my patrons who don't see it and they're like, what are you talking about? He was polite. He complimented you. Well, Max is uh, very good at taking one, two, or three thoughts, intertwining them, interconnecting them into a very long-winded statement. He's learned to do this from many years of professional writing. It's actually quite impressive how you can disguise derogatory comments within a polite compliment. It's, it's quite amazing. So when he starts out with one thing, such as a, a polite compliment, and then ends on another note, it's called a backhanded compliment. It's a very polite way to get over on someone. This is a way of speaking that professional writers learn to do. Writers, journalists, politicians are very good at it. Lane Staley actually talked about journalists doing this to him in an interview. Interviews just kind of got stupid. It was like instead of finding out something new about the band that the last journalist didn't find out, it was more like how can I reword what the last guy wrote so it sounds like an even harsher attack but it's written more eloquently. Everyone I was getting interviewed by and the other guys that we're searching for a, a schnazzy way to write an insult, you know, and disguise it. Essentially an insult disguised as a compliment, as Lane Staley put it. There are several of them throughout the conversation. I was kind of hoping people wouldn't notice, but I guess it was truly that obvious you guys noticed. At this point, it's like the elephant in the room. I can't not talk about it. If you'd like me to, I'll send it to you before, let you watch it before I upload it. To, uh, I mean, I'm not going to censor anything. I'm not going to say, oh, I don't like the way I came off there. So you don't have to do that. But, yeah, yeah, I mean, now I'm an historian that does serious historical uh, uh, research. In conclusion, I asked Mr. Wallace if he wanted to see any edits before I uploaded anything to YouTube, because to me, it seemed quite obvious that he was not reading the room. He was not understanding who he's talking to. And it almost seemed like he's just like talking down. And it became very apparent by the end that uh, he really didn't care. I, I don't think he cares about this community anymore. I, I think he's moved on to more scholarly communities. And um, it was just kind of like, I don't really care what you have to say. Don't care what anybody thinks. Here it is. Take it or leave it. Quite honestly, my first red flag was when I tagged him in a Facebook post about appearing on my channel and he deleted it and then, you know, messaged me and said, don't tag me in anything. <laughs> 
that was my first hint that uh, he did not respect me, did not want his friends to know that he was talking to me. I have no clue why this guy came on my channel. That's what I'm trying to say. Why did he even come on the channel? Now, there is a lot of conversation that you're going to want to watch, but take it with a grain of salt. Check, one, two, check. Check, one, two. Check, one, two, check. Dylan Carlson didn't do it. I'll state that with 100% certainty too. And I don't believe that Dylan Carlson knows who did it. Um, so I will, but I'll, you know, I I think at, at some point people accused us of not of being afraid of being sued, right? Oh, you can't name Courtney as the killer because you're afraid she's going to sue you. First of all, you know, it's really Tom Grant that accused her multiple times of murdering Kurt. And he was never sued. Um, the the or media c conspiracy to murder him, right? <laughs> right, uh, right. Firing somebody or whatever yeah, it might yeah. happen. So I've never been afraid of. And this is another. This is another sort of like sore spot with with us and Tom Grant, right? Tom, Tom says, "Oh, you're too uh, cautious," and uh, we we say there's only circumstantial evidence. There's some strong circumstantial evidence linking Courtney. <laughs> to the uh to the murder but there's no smoking gun and tom says oh uh, with a jury you don't need a smoking gun that's a myth which is true circumstantial evidence can convict somebody right but you know yeah. we, in both our books we talk about rome and ask if courtney did it and wanted him dead why did she call the ambulance right like yes rome, rome. Was suspicious but why did she call the ambulance? Why didn't she just let him die? And then somebody will respond, you know, on the internet 20 years later and say, oh, it was more powerful. The whole story, the suicide would be more powerful than an overdose. She wanted to publicize live through this. Uh, that's These a ridiculous all, statement. Yeah, I mean, mm -hmm. they're not completely ridiculous, right? Like some of these theories, again, like they're not crackpots. These, I respect a lot of these like, like sleuths. These can I, can people. I answer that though, from my opinion? Why, sure. why why she called the ambulance see because i've read conflicting interviews with courtney um you know and one she'll say that she they woke up at 2 a.m and kurt, kurt wanted to make love and and then in another she says i woke up at 6 a.m and, and I, i'm just always... thinking that she she thought he by that point he had possibly been out for so long she probably thought he has brain damage there's no way he's going to come back from this i mean the guy still was in a coma for like Oh, a day at least. Yeah. Again, you that's know? just speculation, though, right? So that's a perfect. Right. It is, and you're that's right. That's a it perfectly is. legitimate theory, right? That's not a crazy theory that you're posing or that some of the other sleuths are posing. But we asked that question, and you know that that gave credibility, right? Our book sold a lot. We, we our book but was. You're, about you're the one who so found it. out that she was lying about the pills in his stomach, right? I mean. How could right. you not think that there was something going on there? I tried to get Max to talk about the Rome doctor, and he changes the subject by politely calling me a dopehead. When but this I is what sets you apart, even for somebody like Tom Grant. This is one of the things I respect about your show. You seem to have a, a legitimacy. You have some knowledge. It's very clear that you have encountered over the course of your life. I don't even know how old you are. People in that drug scene, you understand that scene, right? I never did until we went and jammed with Dylan Carlson in the Seattle shooting gallery. And it started to dawn on, on us what that scene was like. That, then we did a lot of follow-up in that Seattle drug scene and that heroin scene and realized that these people are all junkies. This is just one of many backhanded comments I received from Wallace, both while not recording and recording. We only had a couple conversations, and this guy has made the assumption that I'm an addict. 
or I hang around low lives. or he very clearly states, he, he starts off very respectfully, you know, this is why I respect you. It's very clear that you have a good sense of the drug community. Really, that's why you respect me, not the three years I spent compiling all this evidence and factual information and putting it into one spot. You don't respect that. You respect me because you think I'm a heroin addict. I've never been addicted to any drugs. I've never been a part of any drug scene. He finishes this off by saying they're all junkies. For some reason, there were a couple people who could not understand he was calling me a junkie or someone like that. This is what really pissed me off, making assumptions about me. I don't know this guy. He doesn't know me. If he asked me about my background, he would have found out that I'm just a normal, everyday family man. I work part-time as a male gigolo. I snort coke off silicone breasts. I don't really like the word junkie, but I've been known to fuck some. My favorite kind of weed is cocaine, but that does not mean that I'm an addict. Just because I do some oxys now and then, that don't make me a dope head. The way she goes, bub. And everybody knows Courtney did it. If he doesn't take me or my audience seriously, why should I take him seriously? But there's still a lot of conversation left. And you can listen to it. Just take it with a grain of salt. And there's no question Courtney's a sociopath. She probably would not deny that, right? She lies constantly. Yeah. And so it's not cause and effect. But like, just because she's lying all the time, and we know, like, you could document hundreds and hundreds of lies, right? And I have. And yet, that doesn't prove just because she lied. And I think Tom Grant didn't necessarily understand that. Like, he started to get very suspicious, and rightfully so, of Courtney, right from the beginning, because he right. started to say, oh, she lied about this, she lied about that. What he didn't understand is, number one, junkies lie. They lie all the time. They lie to get their drugs. They lie to, to avoid arrest, whatever they and the people around that that circle in Seattle by the time Kurt had uh had you know achieved huge worldwide fame uh between 91 and 94 he's still surrounded by junkies that whole yeah. country his nanny's a junkie all these people are junkies and and there's so much suspicious activity even you know while he's lying dead in the greenhouse and and when Courtney uh hires tom they're all lying constantly but they're also using his credit card they're also like this whole until you understand that that drug scene that seattle heroin scene uh you, the, 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 you this you is why to look at all these facts and say oh sh the, 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 where there's smoke there's fire right why would you yeah. constantly lie but once you understand that scene you realize that they're constantly lying and this is just Courtney, right? So just because Courtney lies about this doesn't mean that she did this, right? I'm not yeah. saying that she didn't do it. She's still the most likely culprit. There's a lot of, uh, of, of, you know, circumstantial evidence. And one thing I never understand is why people focus on these minute red herrings, all these inconsistencies, and they never really focus on the most convincing evidence of all. I wasn't going to interrupt anymore, but I have to say that every time Wallace spoke to me about, you know, people online and they're concentrating on the wrong things and they're making up these crazy theories, it almost feels like projection because he is responsible for the whole Alan Wrench theory. He created that. Uh, Tom Grant specifically asked him not to write about Alan Wrench in his book because it would cause confusion. And Grant was right. It has caused confusion to this day. So when he says, why do people concentrate on red herrings? You know, I don't get that. He's responsible for the biggest red herring of them all. He makes it clear by the end of the book that he does not believe Wrench had anything to do with it. But he also made it clear to me that from the very beginning, he knew that Alan Wrench had nothing to do with it. And he wrote about him anyway because he was a colorful character and would make his book more entertaining and therefore push sales. By creating this myth, and you have to include people who only read passages or excerpts from books. They don't read the entire book. That's how that myth got created. Of course, Alan would uh, help it along as well. You can watch YouTube videos of him saying he did the deed. But, um, you know, if, you, if you're going to point the finger and be mad at people or talk bad about people for having these bogus theories, then, you know, take a look in the mirror, man. Courtney, yeah. Courtney's lawyer, Rosemary Carroll, right? 
who was incredibly close to both Kirk and Courtney. Absolutely. And so Rosemary Carroll, her suspicions, which are captured on tape, they're not, we don't have to take Tom's word for them, right? Rosemary revealed that they were in the process of getting a divorce, that they had yeah. an agreement. All these things, she was suspicious. She knew the handwriting better than anybody. She she was suspicious of the so-called suicide note, right? Yeah. This is incredibly powerful. Every single person posting their 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 theories about what happened should start off by describing all the Rosemary Carroll stuff and then go on yeah. to theories because that's powerful, right? Uh, just like, you know, I understand why people are still wary of using somebody like El Duce because he's El Duce. Yes, he passed the polygraph test, but then people say, oh, well, polygraphs are not admissible in court, right? They could be fooled, which is true. But Rosemary Carroll, that's like, you know, she could be disbarred for that, for what she did, right? She revealed a lot of stuff. Attorney, Tom, she, yeah. A lot of reveal. Unfortunately, I think a lot of people don't understand this. Tom's recordings were illegally obtained. In California, you need two-party consent, and he did mm. not have her consent. So he was recording all this, and thank God he was, right? Because it gives so much credibility to his case. But, but it would be inadmissible in court. We we were on the Today Show at one point, and you know the Today Show is big, the big, yeah. show, right? one of the biggest, most credible news shows, or uh, you know TV network shows. Is this uh, was the Today Show the one that Katie Couric was on? Exactly. Uh, yeah. Did you and Did you get to meet Katie Couric? I did. Yeah. That's I, awesome. I loved Katie Couric. Yeah, actually. She, I was, I was it was fan. Matt Lauer. Matt Lauer interviewed us, and he was kind of a sleazebag even then. Well, not at not, not at that but, time but publicly. So, no, no, but you could tell like he was so oh. smart. Katie Couric was so friendly. We met her back backstage, but um, but they they were going to play the Rosemary Carroll tapes, and then their lawyer told them, "No, you can't do it because they were taped in." in california and they're uh, they're illegal but cbs this morning which is a smaller network morning show did did broadcast those tapes but um but it I think makes lot- sense it makes that because in a lot of states you only need one party consent you don't need two party consent like in ohio That's anybody right. exactly. can record anybody that right. make it makes sense that california would have a law like that because so many celebrities live there and everybody's trying to get dirt on them yeah so but you know so sense. But, you know, then you start seeing, okay, Rosemary Carroll was married to this punk rock uh, icon, Jim Carroll. And she's married even to this day to Danny Goldberg, who, you know, claims to have discovered Nirvana, right? Like he's one of the most powerful uh, music executives in the world. And so she's caught between a rock and a hard place. She hired the private investigator that dogged us uh, around the country. I think she wanted to know what we knew or what kind of evidence we had right so she showed up we did a lecture tour with hank harrison before our first book came out and there's this very elegantly dressed woman with sunglasses sitting in the front row of one of the auditoriums sticking out like a sore thumb absolutely and it was was rosemary and so it's like wow what what is she afraid of Right. I think at that point, we had no idea that uh, Tom had all these tapes. Right. So she had she wanted to be prepared, prepared right. for. Yeah. And yet, you know, she can't come public. She would be disbarred. She nobody nobody could use these uh, th- this evidence, but she had the evidence. She was suspicious. That's huge. That gives so much credibility to both the case and to uh, Tom Grant. Uh, and and yet. It's still not proof, but the fact that, you know, she's she was the godmother to Francis Bean. Right? Yeah. She was their their entertainment lawyer. She was privy to everything. And she immediately, you know, she would have known if Kurt was super, certainly. And not only didn't she, and she didn't she tell title. Grant, didn't she tell Grant that she did not believe Kurt was. Oh, I yeah, thought, I, yeah, absolutely. I mean, she's one of dozens and dozens and dozens of people that knew him that have now said that. Right. But yeah, that she had not only didn't she think he was, but she believes it was pretty clear that she believes he was murdered. And she believes on one of those tapes, she says the suicide note was forged or traced. So somebody like me, somebody like Tom Grant saying it. Yeah, you could dismiss that. But but, you know, Rosemary Carroll. 
Danny Goldberg still dismisses it. He's never yeah. you know, talked about. Nobody has ever asked him. You and, know, and he never, ag- wife? he never acknowledges it. He, he, yeah, he and I even understand like- why. It's 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 awkward for everybody, including Rosemary. She didn't know she was, it, it, you know, it was being recorded. Unethical. I don't know. It's still a, an open question whether she would have been allowed to share those opinions with Tom Grant. Like he was, he was on Courtney's payroll and so was she. So did she actually violate her ethical uh, code by revealing these things to Tom? Did she breach lawyer client confidentiality? Well, I think, I think the, I think the fact that that's up for uh, debate shows how powerful she felt. She she could have been disbarred, like you said. Well, she Maybe was it was unethical. It was pretty clear. But she people, still yeah. wanted to share this information. So People believe that uh, Courtney sick this private investigator on us. And he tried to... He Jack tried Palladino. To both of our books, Jack Palladino. Okay, so here we go again. Earlier in the chat, in a previous video, Max had told me that Courtney had sick Jack Palladino on them. So that's why I believed that. I've never heard really anything about this. I think the only place it's mentioned is probably in his book. So it's confusing to me that, you know, Mr. Wallace will make these very broad statements like people believe that Courtney sicked yada, yada, yada on us. Well, you're the one who wrote about it. So people are going to believe what you wrote. He had worked for Bill Clinton and Michael Jackson and all kinds of celebrities, right? And people assume that it was Courtney that hired him to to stop us. But we're fairly sure that it was actually Rosemary Carroll that hired him. And so Rosemary was afraid for her own career and her own reputation, I think. Right. And so that that that's pretty powerful. Right. And it is. So hardly anybody talks about that today. But that gives a lot of credit I, for the case. I feel so silly. I, I'm just now working on a video that really dives into Rosemary Carroll. And 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 when I started working on it just a few days ago, I was thinking, why did why have you not done this? Why have you not, you know, it seems so like you said, someone should start right. there and move forward. But I, I guess those, I was just those trying tapes to do are accessible, timeline. right? The tapes are on the internet, some of them. They're, they're on the internet. Um there so, have been a couple recordings that um <clears throat> I was told I'd get to hear and I've never heard them, but so well, I, you know, I've we, given up on that. So we heard Tom, Tom claimed many times during our first investigation, when we, we went and met with him in his Beverly Hills office, he talked about how he taped a lot of people, but he never told us that he taped Rosemary Carroll. He never told us the, the true extent of these tapes. So he years did, later, his cards close to his chest. Years later, we're asked to do a follow-up book for the 10th anniversary of Kurt's death. And by this time, Kurt, uh, Tom has let his uh, private investigator license uh, lapse, I think. Right. Courtney tried to get 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 it uh, pulled. She actually filed a... That's the only legal uh, uh, action that she's ever taken. She stopped Court, uh, Nick Broomfield's movie from being played at Sundance. And she tried to get Tom's uh, license taken away. I did not know that. Yeah. She actually tried to get him fired. <laughs> Exactly, or to to end his Get, career. She tried to him. cancel him. Yeah, but years um, later, he he let his license lapse. And, you know, and he actually told me not to call him PI Grant right, because he could not. get in trouble. If, if they think that he's telling people he's a private investor, I, I totally get it now. Exactly. It's illegal, right? So he yeah. was, but he was managing a hotel in California, a motel in Pismo Beach, and we visited him wanting a follow-up i think he promised us more 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 revelations but yeah we were a little skeptical you know i mean i i don't think tom ever lies again if you spend time with tom you realize he has a lot of integrity but maybe he was exaggerating his evidence uh, we didn't know at that time but he had talked about these tapes and then we we were spending time with him at his motel that he's managing and he brings us to a back room and opens a closet like a storage closet and on the wall is like floor to ceiling cassette tapes. There's hundreds of tapes, all these wow. conversations that he's that he's had over the years. Some of them have come. So, out so he's definitely got more. <laughs> he has a lot more. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So he gave us a whole bunch of that stuff and we used it for our book, for our second book. And he ended up uh, um, making some of it public. 
and you know him going through the the house uh looking for kurt's body that's pretty uh, eerie um and powerful yeah. But he has a lot more, and he's still, you know, how yeah, he hearing hearing them say Kurt, Kurt, oh, that right. is such an eerie, yeah. Call out while you're in that call out, say Kurt, hello, Kurt, you know, make a lot of noise. Kurt! Kurt! You got a statue or something in here. Exactly. But when you hear this stuff on, and then but when we heard Rosemary Carroll voicing her suspicions and talking about the the suicide note being forged that was what case. really got you yeah like all of a sudden it's like we already we already believed tom and knew that he was very credible and yet that was just that blew us away yeah that was i think that was the impetus for the second book hearing it for yourself yeah in her Absolutely. words wow yeah. man and 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 she has never spoken about it again. I don't which, think she can. Which, I, I don't think she's allowed to ethically. She still has that uh, that that for for all I know, nobody really knows this for a fact. Rose uh, Courtney still has her on retainer as an entertainment lawyer, right? So you know that might be that's more than just a conspiracy theory, right? That might, I, I'm not sure how how that stuff works and how the ethical code works but she can I, she can neither confirm nor deny yeah even even if courtney were to fire her though i think she's still ethically bound to not talk about anything that happened when she was a, a client but um she's never going to talk about it she can't i see max i wanted to ask you now you you talked about broomfield you talked about how courtney tried to block his film because they were using nirvana music and of course she's very covetous and wants all the the money you know no and she just wanted it, to stop the film and she succeeded uh, right she got it pulled oh, so she was it wasn't that she was mad that it was going to be shown at uh sundance and, and and she wasn't getting paid she just didn't want the film seen at all well she's done everything she can uh, other than sue to try to stop the the the, cons the so-called conspiracy theories the murder theory from being talked about publicly we went on including tour, making and a completely ridiculous documentary montage of heck which kurt's friend buzz osborne said was 90 percent bs um yeah but no again, no, no what, what i was getting at when you look at these people every time i try to lead the conversation every time i ask a question it's just you're not in control i'm in control of this conversation and i'm going to say what i want to say it's it's not even an interview. It's just me listening to a lecture. When you look at these people putting out their books and their documentaries, again, you you have to understand that these people actually, a lot of them like Courtney. They roll their eyes at Courtney. They know she's a nut job and a sociopath, but she could actually be quite charming as well, right? Yeah, I, I've came, heard that I a came lot. face to face. I came face to face with Melissa Oftemeyer, Eric Erlinson, and Courtney love in montreal you did no, yeah like like after they knew about your book they knew about the book but they didn't know who i was i went to okay. the funeral of melissa oftermeyer's father in montreal he was a oh, okay. well-known journalist and he actually stormed the stage when we were in montreal on, on this uh, lecture tour with hank harrison he stormed the stage and basically assaulted hank harrison and started accusing him of, of all kinds of by this time his daughter was in the band right so he was very close to courtney he was this very charismatic drunk and he liked to you know get drunk but, but also a journalist he was a very well respected journalist yeah earlier but he had he he was sort of an embarrassment by this oh point. okay okay drunk on stage but um but i went to the funeral just because i knew that courtney would probably be there and sure enough she was there with melissa and eric and i came face to face with the three of them standing there in one of the pews and i was tempted to I thought, oh, if I reveal who I am, maybe she'll punch me. It'll get headlines. You should have. My book will have. explode. Hi. Right? Hi. I, I'm the author of Who Killed Kurt right. Cobain. Nice to meet you. I would have done it. That's what I would have done. And yeah, then but I, I was a coward. That, that's I would have put my chin out. Now. Like, I was actually genuinely afraid, of course. That's a payday, man. You could. <laughs> I know. Okay. In retrospect, I, I can. I can uh, plus, it would have been unseemly at a funeral, right? To Courtney have, Love oh, punches sure. guy at funeral. Yeah. Oh my God. I she was on her best behavior and, you know, she wasn't 
making a scene and here I was I, I might have made like a scene that made headlines across the world right so well she punched she was photographed punching one of her fans in the face and the charge was dismissed right wow the, her attorney even argued well the photograph shows her fist back like this but it doesn't show her punching him I mean, that's the type of thing where you could legitimately accuse her of using her money and power to to escape from, you know, justice. But uh, the, I actually read up about the the judge and, and I hate to say this, but I'm going to anyway. It was a female judge who was uh, very um, she she was a known feminist and Courtney was pushing feminism. A lot of people think the judge dismissed the charge simply because Courtney was a woman punching a man that's, that's well, that what brings us to, to our that brings us to our encounter with nicholas hartshorn the... again max changes the subject he does not allow me to interview him or to lead the conversation he's basically just shitting all over me like he doesn't take me seriously at all he just whatever i want to blurt out i'm going to blurt it out there is something to this okay there, there's articles you can read online that talks about the judge dismissing the charges. Now, this was supposed to go to a jury trial. It was unheard of. And this happened in the state of Florida. This was the first case where a judge interfered with the jury and said, nope, I'm not even going to allow this to proceed. I'm dismissing it. It had never happened in Florida before. OK, so there's something to what I'm saying. People have investigated this judge because it was unprecedented. It was it was unheard of what she did to help out Courtney Love to, to essentially assault someone and just get away with it. Like she's literally above the law. This was a good conversation we could have had. But Max decided it was time to move on to Nicholas Harshorn. Now, Max has made all sorts of assumptions about me. So I'm going to go ahead and make an assumption about him. I think he's one of these people that you cannot have an adult conversation with when concerning a woman's poor behavior because he will automatically jump to the conclusion and assume that you are a misogynist. If Max looked in my background, he would see that I've written several videos about women that I look up to, that I admire, and he would also know that probably 70 to 80 percent of my patrons are female now if i was pushing some kind of misogynist hidden agenda i'm pretty sure that all these women would not be supporting my channel i got the feeling from him that he felt as though any time there was any kind of talk about poor behavior coming from a woman he would immediately change the subject nobody was talking about dr harshorn he just says oh well that brings up Hartshorn. That's just him saying I'm uncomfortable with this situation because I'm making assumptions about you. Corner, right? So, yes. Yes. So like, you know, we're we're in his office in Seattle and he had granted us an interview. He didn't know exactly who we were, but he knew we were sort of pursuing the 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 case. And he brings us to his examination room where corpses are laid. He shows us the table where these corpses are often laid out. We didn't see any dead bodies, but Right above his uh, his morgue table, notice uh, there's a poster of Kurt. It's like a, in in the, in the examination room. Yep, on the wall. And then, I think we didn't know this. I think we knew that he had some connection. Maybe Richard Lee told us this at that time, and uh, we asked him about it. But he had a poster. It turns out that in college or medical school. He was a punk rock promoter. Yeah. And he promoted yeah. a Nirvana concert, right? So not he, only he, he also promoted he, Courtney Love's first husband, James Moreland. Right. His band. But we didn't know any of this stuff at the time. And he's like, you know, showing bragging about his connection to Kurt and how much he admired Kurt. And he knew Kurt and he promoted a Nirvana show. And you know, that that's obviously fueled a lot of conspiracy theories, right? But again, I don't think. In fact, I can confidently say I'm just as confident about the fact, you know, Dylan didn't have anything to do with Kurt's death and uh, Alan Ranch didn't kill, uh, didn't kill Kurt. No, Nicholas Archorn didn't cover up the, the, you know, for the autopsy like he but but I, I can say that his connection to Courtney and his connection to Kurt and his knowledge of Kurt being a junkie. He, you know, dismissed. He believed that it was that it was a overdose. And 
then he certainly didn't have any suspicion that it was murder and didn't have any reason to, you know, call the homicide uh, division and ask them to investigate it as a murder. Right. So it, it is yeah. strange, though, that that him because he was the assistant at the time, him and the chief medical examiner were both telling people on the scene this is a suicide. like they're saying this before they've even taken the body out you know okay. that before they've even done the autopsy they're but saying there was a no or what was believed to be a no. uh, i did not get this at all a professional journalist wins awards uh films made after his book like such a smart guy and he's defending the seattle pd's actions the coroner's actions they have protocol they know they are supposed to follow protocol and he's defending them saying well there was this no well come on man you're a journalist like how many people kill someone and then put the gun in their hand and write a suicide note like <laughs> understand why people looking at that note now we know that rosemary carroll looked at the note and said right oh, that's fake and later on it comes out that Nirvana was in the process of breaking up and that the note may have been, you know, a farewell note to his fans. And maybe the, the last lines were added by somebody, Courtney. Um, but at that time, anybody seeing that note would have just assumed, knowing what you knew about not Rome, because Rome hadn't really come out yet as a she started peddling that narrative later. Right. Shortly after. Right. But you knew that this guy was a was a junkie. What in the world is going on with Max Wallace? He's the guy in Soaked in Bleach who, who told us that he investigated and proved that that narrative was not peddled by Courtney until after Kurt was found. Courtney Love says Cobain had first written a note to her, which said, in part, it's not fun for me anymore. I can't live this life. There was a mythology that, oh yeah, everybody knew he was that was just obvious it was no big surprise when he finally killed himself and then you go to those closest to him the people who knew him best and none of them believed he was i never heard kurt talk about suicide or anything he's always seemed happy around me you know quiet shy but definitely happy he never hinted to me that he was depressed he almost said well everybody knew he was the S word, but at the last second he realized, well, I can't say that because that's not true. Nobody ever talked about Kurt Cobain being the S word until after his death. So he changed it at the last second to, he was a junkie. So what, now if you're a junkie, that means uh, you are also depressed and S word? And so it was not that outside of the realm of possibility to look at the scene, to look at the shotgun and to look at the side note and, and assume that it was a open and shut. That's right. what they, I think it was, it was Cameron who I also encountered by the way, later on. That right. Was perspective. But the, 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 the point is they're trained to not do that. I don't um, know. An FBI, an FBI, uh, a, a veteran FBI agent told us that the easiest way to get away with murder is to um, kill a junkie and make it look like a or an overdose, right? Because yeah. people are not even going to question it, and so I understand. It's, it's almost like it's a, a to, it's like a second class citizen or something. Like, well, they were a drug addict, you know, it's bound right. to happen. Yeah, and there I were a lot that. of there were a lot of you know high profile ODs certainly in Seattle and and Hartshorn had seen a lot of those, right? So the it's it's not again it's not really outside the realm of probability right so then you look at the what we know now and say oh well courtney there's a lot of conspiracy theories talking about how courtney yeah. bought him off or that he somehow knew and he was friends with courtney none of that is credible right you don't it's think much so. more credible and again i spent time with nick archer who also died yeah yeah later yeah. on a lot of people died mysteriously which adds to the to the, the the conspiracy Just stuff, right? Coincidence but, after coincidence. It's but, like, but he did he did uh you know he was an aficionado of one of the most dangerous sports in the world, base jumping, and he died base jumping. It's not that unlikely, but again, it's like oh look, Nick Hart Hartshorn was he, involved in this case, and he he ended up dying, right? So that's true. Base jumping very dangerous. People do die yeah. from it.
Yeah. Uh, but I will say that he was he was very experienced. He had done over 200 jumps. He knew how to fold his whatever they use, you know. But yeah, it, it could still happen. Yeah, but these are, totally. you know, adrenaline junkies, right? They, right, they right. pursue when, more and more dangerous uh, uh, adventures. I have personally never subscribed to the idea that Harshorn was somehow, you know, the, that the accident wasn't just an accident. I, base jumping is so dangerous and people die doing it all the time. What concerns me more is that Mr. Wallace talks about how proud Harshorn was of his association with Kurt Cobain. He had a poster of Kurt Cobain in the examination room where they would wheel, you know, these bodies into to do autopsies. And he moves to Florida and the people that he became friends with in Florida, these people involved in the, the base jumping community, they had spent hundreds of hours with Harshorn. They knew him very well, and they said he never once talked about doing Kurt Cobain's autopsy. He never once talked about uh, doing Kristen Fass' autopsy. They knew nothing about it. So how do you go from living in Seattle bragging about your association, being so proud of the fact that you promoted an early Nirvana show and Courtney Love's first husband's band, The Leaving Trains, or Leaving Trains, whatever they were, and then you move as far away as you can to the southeast in Florida and never talk about that association again. You, you were talking about uh, being in the examination room. He's got a poster of Kurt Cobain. Did he ever mention anything about Kristen or, or you guys just talked about Kurt? I think at that time we hadn't even I mean, I, I know we talked about Kristen Pfaff at the first uh, in the first book. So at, at some point we I mean, we did Harshorn? Harshorn never bring up that no, fact, good, but he... no, I mean, he would never have brought it up. But the question is, did we ever ask him about it? I don't think we did. Okay, here we go again with the assuming. Uh, well, I think the question you need to be asking is, did we ask him? No, I had the question right the first time. The reason why I wanted to know if he ever brought up Kristen is because he's bragging about his association with Kurt to them. So I assumed he might brag about other musicians, famous musicians, in relation to Kurt Cobain and Courtney Love to him as well. The impression that Max gives me, and I'm assuming you as well, is Harshorn was very proud of this association with this very famous person. So I assumed if he was the kind of person who name dropped and was proud of his associations with people, he might say, oh yeah, I did Kristen Fass as well. And I knew her, I talked to her, you know, I was trying to see if Harshorn had a relationship with Kristen Pfaff as well. I don't okay. think we even okay. knew at that time when we first, you know, interviewed Hartshorn uh, on our, that this is the very first trip to Seattle and Aberdeen and all those places um, where we get brought around by Richard Lee. Uh, we were still familiarizing ourselves with the case, right? So we never had a chance to ask uh, Hartshorn about Kristen. I see. Right. So no, and no, and, no, and he would end up taking off to Florida, of course, so. Yeah, I'm curious. How did you get in contact with Kurt's grandpa? Uh, 